Hi, Priscilla. You are my first interview. And I hope that this is a project that will be continued for a long, long time to come. Um, just to start things off, Priscilla, how did you get into the book business in the first place? Uh, I got into the book business um, by accident, uh, as I think a lot of people did. Um, I had worked for a publishing house for seven years and a book club for four years in New York City. And I kind of wanted to get out on my own and do something for myself. Uh, there really was a glass ceiling at that time in the publishing industry for women. This was in the 1970s. And um, one of my father's friends uh, was an art dealer. He was uh, in charge of the old master department at uh, Herschel and Adler Gallery. And, uh, no, sorry, Nodler's. He was at Nodler's. And uh, he said, well, you know, I know this man who's into books, and you're into books, and we'll have lunch there next week. I'll call you and set it up. And so the next week, I found myself having lunch with John Fleming. Mm. And uh, we got on very well. And John said, well, you should become an antiquarian bookseller. That's what you really want to do, I think. And uh, I said, well, I don't know anything about it. He said, you do, but you don't know what you know. So come and work for me for a year, and then you can go out on your own. And I wow. did. Uh, and then I realized very quickly that I could never do it on my own with, at the level I wanted to without his customer base. So I found a way to make him my partner. And I uh, bought a collection of books in Argentina, and I brought it to the United States. And I called him and asked him to come and have a look. And he thought it was fabulous. And I said, right, do you want to buy half? And if you do, we'll be partners. And not only this, but for this collection, but any other mm, books or people that we get as a result of this collection. So for mm, book arts, I was John's partner for the last seven years of his life. Wow. Did you enjoy your relationship with John? I loved every second of it. He was a, I know that some people have said he was difficult and not nice to other booksellers, but he was completely wonderful to me. Um, I learned so much from him. Uh, there isn't a day go by, goes by that I don't think of the debt that I owe that man mm. for how much he taught me. Well, that's, that's a great start. Uh, and uh, his customers were legendary. Back in 81, 82, 83, I was having lunch with People like Lessing Rosenwald and Arthur Houghton and Walla Barrett and names that, uh, yeah. you know, are quite legendary in, in the book world that are really from the first half of the 20th century, not the second Sound half. The second half, right. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's quite a group of individuals. Yeah. Um, when you first started in the trade on your own, do you have any, like, fond recollections? Are there things that come to mind about your early years in the trade that that you think might be interesting to... I've got to interrupt. I can see your left hand when you gesture. If you could avoid doing it... Okay. I'm sorry, continue. So, um, do you have any fond memories of your early years in the trade? Well, yeah. Um, uh, John, um, for the first, that Argentinian collection, uh, was a collection of French leave d'artiste, and they were in designer bindings, and they were very showy, and... Um, they would display well. And John, I, I had no idea what to do with the collection. I mean, but no idea whatsoever how to sell it. John said, well, this is what we have to do. We have to do a catalog. And it's got to be a big catalog. And it's got to be four color. Uh, this is in 82, so a four color catalog was a pricey mm -hmm. undertaking. And a production. Uh, and he said, we have to get someone good, so a scholar to do the cataloging. We have to have names as part of the catalog. Um, you can sort that out with the people up at Harvard. You'll find some people to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I kind of um, figured out, got um, Peter Witt to do the uh, descriptions, and Eleanor Garvey, the, um, then the curator, uh, the Hofer curator of printing and graphic arts at the Houghton, and Peter had been the previous curator. Um, to write the introduction, and so John said, well, we have to have uh, uh, an opening. And um, uh, I said, well, how do we do that? <laughs> he said, well, first of all, we have to take all the books out of the, his big room, the big Rosenbach uh, oh, yeah. great room, and we put all the books upstairs, uh, and then uh, we put 
this, these books up for display, and he invited people for uh, a party. And I was absolutely stunned to see Mr. and Mrs. Krauss walk in, huh. because I thought Mr. And Mrs. that H.P. was John's only rival, only possible rival yeah, in, New York, in City. New York City, and they couldn't have been any friendlier to one another. And H.P. came over to me and said, my dear, this is a beautiful catalog, and I understand you did it, and I want to congratulate you. I almost fell over. <laughs> I was, I was so, so thrilled. I mean, I just, you know, that I had that kind of a compliment from this man uh, who was so legendary, as was John. I w felt very good about it. But afterwards, I asked John. I said, I didn't know that you and H.P. were such good friends. He said, oh, he said, what a story. He said, Joe and I, Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Fleming, were in the Caribbean for um, a week's vacation. And it rained the entire week, and no one else was there. The only other people at the resort that we were at, and it was Little Dick's and one of the rock resorts, were Mr. and Mrs. Mrs. Krause. Oh, gee. So they ended up spending the week together because there was no one else there. <laughs> they couldn't do anything or go any place because it rained every single day, and they became, they became very wow. close friends. That's something that probably a lot of people don't know. Exactly. Don't so know. I thought, you know, I, I thought that might be, but it certainly floored me. Wow, that, that's great. I want to ask you some things about what you think of the current situation. Um, what aspects of the book business do you think have changed since the inter internet revolution? Oh, I think that um, the general trade in used and out of print books has changed completely, that, that the internet will undoubtedly um, make more books, make used and rare bookstores increasingly obsolete or uh, financially untenable to maintain unless you happen to own your building or uh, have a situation um, where you're not w worried about making a, um, uh, a monthly rent payment mm. uh, and, and to be open all the time to pay salaries to, e even if you're paying a, a very, you know, you're using students or, you know, paying low wages, it's still awfully expensive to run a, a, mm. a used and out of print, a big used and out of, used and out of print bookstore. Are you currently on the internet? With yes, I am. With your inventory, yes, I am. What what would be what would you consider your experience? Um, how do you feel about the internet as a sale tool and as a buying tool? Um, as a selling tool, it works in that people can view uh, JPEGs, elect digital images of the books that I handle, which is very important because all my books are visual, or most right. of my books are visual. Um, uh, as a buying tool, the other, um, besides book arts, uh, 20th century and contemporary book arts, the other um, uh, field that I deal in is American women writers and reformers. And I found it uh, useful to buy uh, on the internet in that area. But it's not always, um, it's an imperfect tool because often, uh, the sort fields or the categories that I'm searching for just aren't aren't yeah. there. I mean, I'd be interested in women mm, printers or women publishers, and some most people who post things on the internet don't aren't aren't booksellers the way the members of the ABA are, and they right. don't know what what the importance of something is, uh, and they might not catch that because a woman printed it. Um, even though it's a male publisher, that there was a, a woman printer involved in it. Have you gotten any, like, customers from strange places that you probably would have never gotten had you not been on the Internet? Mm, uh, yes, uh, uh, but not really repeat customers. Really? In other words, they're one-off sales. They're so, in other words, the, the, the customers you've gotten off the Internet are just one-trick ponies right. in a sense. Right, yes, exactly. They buy one book yeah. and you never hear from them again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people's experience uh, is that way. Although, um, it's hard to say with people in the United States if they didn't see, um, were looking for something, see a book, and then call me or write me or approach me at a book fair. It's, it's tough to know that they didn't come to me uh, another way. 
you know, that they yeah. didn't, the, fir the first exposure to my name wasn't on the internet. Did you, as an individual, have a difficult uh, transition period from the way we used to do business to the world of computers? No, I got my first computer in 1983. Um, uh, as soon as we sold that first catalog, John and I sold the, the collection on Block. Um, I went out with part of the proceeds and bought a, a computer um, and a printer and uh, uh, set it up and asked John if he wanted to do the same thing because he still he had three by five index cards and a Rolodex. Yeah, like and, most of us did. And uh, and he said absolutely not. He didn't want any part of <laughs> learning it. But but I from that part point on, I got my inventory on a, data, on a database. If you were entering the book trade today, would you, how would you go about it? Do you, think, do you think it's still viable for people to come into this trade and to flourish? Sure, but um, I didn't come into the trade till I was 35, so when any, anyone says, oh, all well, booksellers, you know, it's a... Uh, no young, there are no young booksellers. Well, I wasn't young when I started being a, a bookseller. Um, uh, I think that you have to find some, you have to first of all understand the collecting mentality if you're not a collector yourself. Uh, and I certainly did. I'm married to a collector. My parents were both collectors. I understand the collecting mentality yeah. even though I don't, don't necessarily collect. Um, but you have to find something that you love, an area that you love that you can be completely devoted to intellectually um, because if you don't think about what you're doing all the time, you're not going to be a success yeah. at it. This is the kind of business where you have to really be, um, put your blinders on and think about only your business. Yeah. I've often wondered what it would be like to start in the trade at this, this stage of the game. There's so much knowledge available that wasn't available when mm -hmm. people like us first started. It's just... I mean, if someone wanted to deal in, in contemporary book arts the way I do, I don't, I don't think it'd be all that hard. I think they could do it very easily. Yeah. Um, uh, they just have to be passionate about it, uh, you know, really love the, the, the field. Um, what do you see as the great challenges facing the antiquarian book trade in the years ahead? Uh, I think that uh, perhaps the greatest challenge is going to be uh, making customers aware of what it is that you have to sell. And I think that our book fairs are perhaps the best way, um, but I, I'm not, and I have no idea how to do this, but I find that when there's a convergence between um, scholars, institutions, rare book libraries, uh, collectors and dealers that it's the most profitable uh, not only financially but uh, intellectually and emotionally of um, interactions and uh, I think our book fairs, the ABA book fairs have got to be more uh, event oriented so that it's not just a place to go in and shop. I think you, th that uh, Did you clarify what you mean by event-oriented? Well, um, I'm thinking of um, uh, an event that was organized by Wellesley College um, a year ago, June, called the ABC Book Arts Conference. And it was a two-day event at Wellesley College that Ruth Rogers organized and did a very good job uh, organizing. Um, there were panel discussions about contemporary book arts, and uh, there were what's the role of the dealer, what's the role of the institution. There were all panel discussions. They went on for two days straight. Um, uh, there were book artists, all kinds of book artists, not just um, uh, people who do fine printing or people who do binding. and. Uh, it was in a very relaxed setting, although there was a fair every afternoon. So there was an opportunity after talking about the books to go to see physically them, see them. To physically see them. And it may well be that um, uh, we want to think about having, as we do at the Boston Book Fair, having talks, having other events where people can listen to, to a scholar talk about a collection that's at their institution. 
uh, and what's interesting about it and have a chance to see some of those things um, as well as um, buy some of those things. Um, what part does the book fair play in your total business structure? I mean, how many book fairs a year do you do? Do you find them X percentage of your business? Do you meet X percentage of your customers? I mean, is there some uh, logical explanation no. why you do what you do? No, there isn't. There really isn't. I wish I could say that, that you know, I, I mean, uh, if I were um, a graduate of business school, I might have this all sorted out, but uh, <laughs> I'm not and I don't. Yeah. Um, I uh, look, at, I do New York, the New York Antiquarian Book Fair, and I do the Boston Antiquarian Book Fair. And then if there's a book arts conference, uh, I'll do that as, as well. Um, so this February, for example, I'll be going to San Francisco because there's a, con a book arts conference there. And um, uh, this past fall, I spoke uh, at the Guild of Book Workers' 100th um, anniversary celebration uh, and also at the Guelia Club, I did a symposium on, on fine binding. Um, did I sell anything? Not exactly. Uh, but even if I don't, even if I do a book fair, I consider it uh, advertising. Mm. As Flying much the as flag. I, yes, as much as I do selling books, although um, at the New York Book Fair and at the Boston Book Fair, I usually end up selling uh, uh, a great deal uh, of things. And also it's an opportunity for people to see what's there, and I never know if two months later, if someone orders a book, it's not because they didn't see it at the Boston Book Fair or the New York Book Fair. Um, uh, so much of this th these things are visual. Um, my inventory is the kind of thing where you, people really want to see it and handle it um, and get a feel for it before they, they actually buy I mean, it. You, you have some incredibly beautiful books that are, that are objects of art, yes. uh, really, yeah. more than they are books. And, yeah. And some of them are just so spectacular that without physically seeing them, you miss you, the whole yes, point. Yes, you miss the whole point of them, yeah. And, uh, and, yeah. and so from that point of yeah. view, yeah. So I consider it advertising, and so I do it. Now, I don't do the West Coast fairs. I've never done very well at San Francisco. Um, uh, and I don't know why that is, but um, I just it just wasn't profitable enough for me. Do you think it's because there are so many exhibitors that... You know, yeah. the amount of time that one has to spend has to be divided. Yes, yes. Uh, in the scheme of things, that's, uh, you know, I mean, I, I could also be that I was bringing the wrong books. I mean, well, I don't think uh, that's the issue. I think more that when you have 240 exhibitors, it's very hard for an individual to yes. have the stamina to, to go through every booth, I yeah. would think. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I guess I, I would have to do a, more travel out there to make myself more well known yeah. so that my booth would be a destination location when they came into a fair of that size. And um, I find it easier to jump in my car and go up and down the East Coast yeah. <laughs> or to New York sure. <laughs> or, or a little bit west to, sell, to show the books, to take my show on the road. Now, at one time, Priscilla, you had an open shop yes. in Cambridge. Right, right in Harvard And um, how long did you have the shop? Uh, why did you eventually decide not to have it open any longer? And further to that, what do you see as the future of the open bookshop in America? Uh, the open shop that I had, uh, I opened it in 1993. Before that, I dealt privately yeah, in, in Boston for uh, 13 years because I started in 1980 up here. Um, uh, and then we moved to uh, Kennebunk, Port Maine in two, March of 2005. Yeah, it's, it's been about a, a year uh, and a half. A year and a half. And um, I, I had the feeling that it was really a waste of time for me to have a, an open shop. Um, people were coming in not looking for what I was specializing in because I wasn't a generalist book dealer. Uh, and I think that as the internet pushes out the general used bookstore and even the general rare bookstore that more and more people are going to specialize in the area that interests them the most and therefore an open shop is not going to be all that useful. Well, I may be wrong there, um, but that's what I found for my particular area. When you scout 
for the kinds of things that you want to buy, you probably do it in a completely different way than the general bookseller does. Yeah. You're looking for a very specific uh, area. Do you go into open bookshops to scout, or do you mainly yeah. find your stuff by buying collections? No, I, find, I do go into open bookshops, but mostly I find my things um, in the field of uh, women's rights um, and women reformers and writers um, by reading dealers' catalogs, the same old, same, same old, way we same, all, always did. Same it. old, same old, yeah. uh, and I find them extremely useful. Um, uh, there are certain dealers' catalogs that, as soon as they come in, I can't wait to have a look because uh, I know they're going to have something interesting, and it's going to be well. It's going to. I know what I'm going to be buying. That's not a not a nasty shock. Yeah. Um, as for the book arts, um, I try to. Um, I try to make myself as visible as possible at any um, group gathering of book artists, whether it's the Guild of Book Workers or um, uh, any arts conference. If anyone asks me to speak, uh, I'll go. Uh, you know, I don't take honorariums. I pay my own way. I mean, I figure that's part of my, my right. job. You yeah. know, that's part of my business um, to encourage uh, young artists to, to, to make books. Uh, that's great. Uh, just before we, we finish off, I'd just like to ask you um, if you can remember something standing out in your mind, the, the best buy you ever made and the biggest disappointment you ever had. Does anything stick out in your mind? Uh, well, the best buy has to be the, uh, the collection of uh, Ligue d'Artiste from Argentina. From because Argentina. That got you going. That got me going, and it got me John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> which, true. Which got but, me going. Yeah, which got you going. Yeah. <laughs> um, the biggest disappointment. Um, Edith Wharton's baby rattle. I can't imagine that someone hasn't bought that. It just makes me, <laughs> it's so wonderful. It's just, you know, this was the, uh, uh, the baby rattle that, that was hers. It has her name on it. It's perfectly documented. She gave it to the um, only child of her best friend in France on that child's christening, and I got it from that child. So the provenance is there, um, and her baby mug was given to um, someone, uh, to the, her friend in the, the child of her friend in the United States, to whom she left her copyrights. And so those are the only two personal objects wow. that have ever been out there for sale. Um, and I just don't understand <laughs> why someone hasn't bought it, but I still have Edith Wharton's baby mm. rattle. <laughs> Well, I, I hope you do something with it other than just talk about it. Yeah. Um, just as a passing, uh, just to finish off, Priscilla, do you have any words of wisdom for booksellers who are going to be coming along? Is there any one thing you'd like to tell them to be aware of or to do uh, to help them on their way? Mm, what can I uh, do? What you love. Uh, if you don't really love it. If you don't, re if you're not really into the subject you're dealing in, if you don't really love books, it's not for you. It's not, uh, do something else. Um, but if you really love it, then stick with it because it's extremely rewarding. Um, and uh, the other thing I'm going to say is um, make friends with your colleagues in the a and try to join the ABAA. It will return. It will return. It, it'll come back to you. It, the returns are wonderful. Um, these are. It's a ready-made bunch of folks who love the same thing that you you love, um, and I never ever see these people as my rivals. I see them as my colleagues, and that's the that's the way to go. That's the bottom line. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Priscilla. My pleasure. <laughs>